You turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 49. I'll give you a little intro here. Um, this is a message to those who believe in the Christ of Scripture and uh, under his ministry and, and seeking to understand <laughs> their interest and hope in the gospel. And specifically, the issue is kind of like the, the, the notion of despairing and uh, being depressed about anything in life. It doesn't really matter what, whether it's uh, something at the job or finances or family problems, health issues, dating, marriage type problems, school problems. They can all seem overwhelming at any, at any point in time. It's even easy to matter, uh, despair about matters uh, of the church and the health of the church and the direction of the church uh, or just, just generally the church at large. I know uh, uh, Richard Warmack's church down there in Louisiana, he's got a church about like ours, I suppose, in terms of size and everything. And that town is full of churches, uh, gigantic churches. I've never seen buildings as quite as big as this. One of them has uh, 16 pastors, so uh, the world thinks that uh, uh, you know that's they, they equate that with success. And then you see the little churches where the gospel is preaching, and you think, well, it's, you know, Lord, where where is your church, and and what are you doing with it? Uh, and uh, and you can in when you're feeling depressed or uh, down about one thing or another, you know, the, the world religions would say, you know, carry on and put a fake your way through it, put on an act, and that's not that's not a scriptural way. Uh, God's people will seek out comfort in the truth of the word, in fellowship and prayer for one another. And I want to focus in on some things that God rem to remember about what God is doing with your life, and some things He's forgotten about your life, that's what, what He remembers and what He's forgotten. So in Isaiah forty nine and verse. 15 you see speaking to the church can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb yea they may forget yet will i not forget thee behold i have graven thee on the palms of my hands thy walls are continually before me thy children shall make haste thy destroyers and they that made thee waste shall go forth of thee uh, lift up thine eyes round about and behold and all these gather themselves together and come to thee uh, the um, well that last verse there as I live saith the Lord thou shalt surely clothe thee with them all as with an ornament and bind them on thee as a bride do it and that that verse here in Isaiah 59 49 15 through 18 there's some um, one there's the statement that uh, you know the father do, does not forget uh, the church nor the people in the church and that where he says uh, thy walls are continually before me uh, the word for walls there that, that is, it's walls of protection it's a defensive a defensive structure he knows exactly what you're vulnerable how you've been attacked and what your defenses are your situation is always before him what your situation is in the world and in terms of uh, uh, whether you're being assaulted or whether you're not he under he is there uh, overseeing everything that comes your direction we'll see more of that in another verse here shortly it's an exciting part about this verse he goes you know he's graving you on the palms of his hands you know if a, if a mother could forget her her newborn baby and then I, I would forget the even more so I mean a mother might forget a newborn baby but he'll never, never uh, forget you. Uh, those that uh, are under the uh, sound of the gospel and, and, and lay hold of, the, of this Christ. He goes, he goes on to say, Thy children shall make haste. And uh, they're talking about believers that hear this gospel. The sound of the gospel goes out and guided by that, he calls people to the gospel. And uh, he's, he's talking here about they're going to come and they're going to hear is what he's saying there and if you if you don't believe it or if you wonder about that the next verse is the real tip-off the real tip-off about that because he says lift up your eyes 
round about, and behold, all these gathered together and come to thee. Turn uh, to John chapter 4. And you see Jesus saying the same thing in, in this context. In John chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, Jesus says, Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He's talking there, he's talking about that... Uh, this notion that the, there are those that God intends to hear this gospel, that they they when they hear it, they're going to, as it says in uh, uh, in Isaiah, they're going to haste. They're going to make haste and say, "I, I want to be there. I want to hear that." And so we see the same thing in Isaiah: uh, "Lift up your eyes round about, and behold, the, all these gather themselves together to come to thee. They're coming to hear the gospel." That's so God hasn't forgot his church. He hasn't forgot his church. He won't forget it. Their situation is always front and center to him. And he'll bring in people as it pleases him, as they hear the sound of this gospel, they'll haste to come in and uh, lift up your eyes and look around. Look around. He says. He said Jesus said it to the disciples then in Isaiah, they said the same thing. Lift up your eyes, look around. Behold all these people come together come to thee and he goes as I live saith the Lord thou shalt surely clothe thee now he's talking about the church now the, the church is going to be clothed with them these new believers that come in uh, they are part of uh, the ornaments of the church bound around the church and as the bride before Christ that's, that's the picture so point number one God doesn't forget his church he doesn't forget his church and keep in mind, when we talk about church, it's, it's, it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of those who profess to know this Christ, and it's a combination of those that come to hear this Christ. They hear the, they hear the Scripture. They don't know their interest. They're, in the Old Testament, they were called strangers, the strangers that were with the Jews. Ruth was one of those. She said to her mother-in-law, his mother said, go on, go your way. You, know, where you're, you go to your world and your religion. I'm going this way. And she said, I, I can't. I, I've got to be. I'm, you go where you go. I'm going to go. Your God is my God. I'm going to be there. And that was the the picture of one who's under the sound of the gospel that says, "Hey, I, I'm here. I don't know what my interest is, but I'm here." And uh, that's to, in 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 the eyes of God, that is the church, the, the believers and those strangers that are in the midst don't know their for certain their status, but they come to hear. Um. Point two, what does what does God remember? We know that He doesn't; He hasn't forget forgot His people, or His children, uh, or uh, the, His children inside the church. And uh, if you want some examples of that, uh, you don't need to turn there. But you know the story of the prodigal son. Uh, he went away from his father, did uh, wasted his living, his inheritance on riotous living. It says. But uh, when, it, when he returned, when he turned and he, he came to the end of himself, uh, when he came, uh, it says, uh, he rose and came to his father. And it says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. The implication is the father was always waiting. The father was always waiting, never forgot, never forgot. His son was out there and uh, patiently remembering and patiently waiting. Uh, in Genesis chapter 45, there's the story of Joseph. I'm going to turn to this passage later on, so I don't want you to turn there, but you know the story of Joseph. Joseph was, uh, um, let me give you the basics of the story. Turn to Genesis 37. Joseph was one of the 12 sons of Jacob. And in, verse, in cha chapter 37 of Genesis.
I'll just read the I'll just read the introduction. We'll come back to the some of the later part later on. In verse uh, one, it says Jacob dwelt in the land of wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being seventeen years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father. Um, their evil report. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. You probably, there's a whole play on that. I haven't seen the play, but Joseph in the Technicolor coat. So, and when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream. He told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he, he, he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And so you know this. So that's the background of the story. But here's, here's, kinda, here's the interesting part. Uh, they're going to take Joseph... Uh, he's going to, uh, his father's going to send him out into the field to find his brother. And, uh, and I'll tell you a little story about that in a little bit and how he finds his brother in the city called Dothan. So he catches up with his brother and as soon as they saw him coming, they said, well, now's our chance. Let's, let's get rid of this guy. We have had it with him. Deep, deep hatred for him. So uh, they debate on whether to kill him or what to do with him. And so they finally say, well, let's just throw him in a, you know, throw him in a pit. So they throw him in the pit. And um, he ends up being found by others who end up selling him to the Egyptians. He goes down to Egypt, and there he becomes a uh, the, the king's right-hand man. But here's the important point. God brings along a terrible, terrible famine for seven years. And Joseph's brethren have to come and do obeisance, just like this dream says. They have to do obeisance and ask Joseph as the second, the right-hand man to the king for food to survive. Here's the thing. Just like Christ, Joseph didn't forget his brother. Didn't forget it. Turn to uh, Genesis 50. The point I'm making is God remembers. Um... But make, make that um, Genesis uh, I said Genesis 50 but it's not it's earlier than that it's uh, Genesis 45 Joseph had been kind of uh, putting his brother brethren through the hoops. They didn't uh, they didn't know it was Joseph. He was speaking to them in a different language with an interpreter and things like this. He knew it was his brethren, and he was providing for them the whole time, not you know, not thinking back on them with hatred about what they did, but but uh, providing for them in every way for their welfare and their care. And then in verse uh, chapter forty five, it says that Joseph. When he, his brethren came in, they're back for more food, and uh, there's a, an issue going on with uh, one of the one of the brothers that he wanted to to, to see. But Joseph couldn't refrain himself from all, all them that stood by, and he cried, "Cause every man to go out from me!" And there stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known to his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, "I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live?" And his brethren could not answer, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. Uh, and anyway, he's, he makes himself known one-on-one -on -one to them. Uh, not like uh, so as a picture of Christ remembering his brother and notwithstanding what they had done and uh, despite all their deeds it didn't matter turned to, back to Isaiah <laughs> in 
chapter 44. Verses uh, 21 to 23, the Lord says, in verse 21 rather, Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy, thy sins and return unto me. For I have redeemed thee. Here's, here's what he remembers. He remembers Jacob. And here's what he forgets. His transgressions. And that's an exciting thing. So God remembers. Whether it's the picture of the father of the prodigal son. And his deep care and concern. Always watching for him. Or whether it's Joseph. Uh, remembering his brethren. Though they could, care, could have cared less for him. Or if it's as it's in this picture here. God saying. You'll not be forgotten of me. Your, your sins, they're gone. But you are not forgotten. So point number three, to address kind of this need that I was talking about when you're facing challenges and, and uh, it's easy. Whitey Hers of the Cardinals used to say, you get your dopper down when the battle gets hot. And turn to Matthew 6, if you would. And then we'll go to Romans right after that. These verses you've probably heard quite a few times. In Matthew, they're both in Matthew 6. They hit about God knowing your need, knowing the situation you're in and knowing your need. In Matthew 6, 8, it says, uh, Don't pray like the heathen do, that you just vain repetitions. They think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Be not therefore like unto them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. Whatever your situation is, God says to you, he knows your need more than you know it because when you ask him it's like he, he already knew that turn down to Matthew 6 the same chapter uh, 31 to 34 we're all in human nature is to get worried worried about what we shall eat it says in verse 31 what shall we what will we drink how are we going to get clothing for all these things the Gentiles seek for your heavenly father knows you have need of all these things but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For, the, for tomorrow shall take thought of the things of itself. Sufficient unto the, unto the day is the evil thereof. And so again, kind of God, Christ making clear here. The Father knows the things you need. He knows what you need even before you know what you need. Turn to Romans, as I've said before. So, so to, to uh, recap point one, God has not forgotten you. He knows your situation. He knows the walls, the defenses around you, what, what is there and what's not there. He remembers your situation. He remembers it in loving kindness. He knows your need. And here's, your, here's the point, probably the key point for the night. Your need is by design. Your need is absolutely by design. And here's, if you've never seen this, it's it's pretty wild. In Romans 8 and verse 28, it says, And we know all things work together for good to them, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. There's some really important little thoughts there. First of all, Paul says, we know. He's not persuaded or most of the time or I think things will work to the good. He says, we know all things. All things. Not some things, not most things. We know that all things, now here's a kicker, work together. They work together. So as you look at the, 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 uh, the different currents that occur in your life and the different things that come your direction, from the right hand and from the left, from the north, from the south, everything that happens to you is happening for your good. I'll show you an example of that if we'll go back to Genesis on this story of Joseph. And I saw this last night, and I, and I turn back to Genesis, if you would. 
It's the oddest thing. Back to Genesis 37. You want to see how the littlest things work together for good? The littlest things. Israel, that's Jacob, told Joseph in verse 13, Don't your brethren feed the, flo in the flock in Shechem? Come and I will send you unto them. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Go, I pray thee, to see whether it be well with thy brethren and well with the flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. So Joseph is going to Shechem to find his brother. Okay? They're not there. They're not there. So look at this. Uh, in verse 16, he uh, and a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? And he said unto them, I seek my brother, and tell me, I pray thee, where they feed their flocks. And the man said, They are departed hence. For I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. Some guy walking in the field, just wandering around, had to meet, had to meet Joseph at that time to tell him where his brethren were. Otherwise, he would have gone back, and would he have ever, ever ended up in Egypt? Maybe not. But he had to be there, and that man had to be he had to be wandering aimlessly, not knowing where anything was happening. This man comes up to him and says, "Oh, your brethren? They're over there." And by that, by that very instruction, this meeting a man in the middle of nowhere, he ended up in the pit, and then in, and then ended up in Egypt. And as he said in Isaiah uh, in Genesis fifty. And by that, God preserved them alive. But if he had not met this man out in the middle of nowhere, it would have never happened. So in Romans 8.28, when it says all things work together for good, he means all things. All things. You know, we, we get, we're so quick to gripe, you know, well, this didn't happen, and I didn't get this job, or I... <laughs> I didn't do well on this test or this or that or the other thing. They all work together. And you might note, um, uh, you know, so, uh, affliction never works alone. It always works at, at, at multiple levels. That's all, also the implication here. Uh, if you were Irish, you'd say, if it's not one thing, it's another. And that's the way it is with affliction sometimes. If it's, you know, it's a, it's a multitude of things that come your way. But in all of these things, you can trace the wisdom and the love of God ordaining your situation. Because it's according to his purpose. For, the, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So the principle upon which all of this stands is it's according to his purpose. And that excludes any idea of the merit of man. You, you know, a, why do good people have bad things happen to them and all this baloney that the world sells? Okay. Uh, for believers, everything works to the good. It doesn't matter that the world thinks it's horrible. God says it's good. If it's coming your direction and it's coming through the gospel and it's coming by the hand of God to you, it's good. And that's a certain thing. Uh, that principle according to his purpose, I think, uh, was read this morning out of 2 Timothy 1.9. You don't need to turn there. We're told that we're saved with a, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is the same thing it's saying here in Romans 8.28. So it's a certainty. We know, we know these things are certain because God says it's so. God says it's so. It's good. Okay. Uh, so your need is finely crafted and tuned exactly by God for you. Whether you have a health problem, whether you don't have a job that you like, whether you need this or you need that, that need is there by the very loving hand of a God. And we know that's true. It's a certainty. It's an absolute certainty. So in conclusion, you know, life is going to be full of challenges. You know, things that uh, we think aren't going our way. Look at Jacob when he was talking to Pharaoh. You don't need to turn there in Genesis 47, 9. I give you the quote. When he talked to Pharaoh about his life, he said, few and evil have the days of my life been. 
life can be rough. Life can be rough. Uh, Moses, you know, did he have a picnic? Age 40, he ends up in the desert as a shepherd. It was the, was the king's uh, number one uh, uh, son, if you will. Uh, had it all. Ends up in the desert for 40 years, just shepherding on the lamb from the law, by the way. If they ever found him, he would have been probably killed uh, before God used him for a different purpose. Uh, Samson, I would not call Samson a real good picker of girlfriends. Uh, had a rough go. Had a rough go. Uh, look at David. He had a son Absalom. You know, just way off the reservation. Rebe rebe rebellion in every way. Breaking his father's heart. Uh, not to mention Bathsheba and her, her son dying. And that whole debacle. That's a rough life. That's a rough life. We're called to a life following Christ. And that by itself means there's going to be friction in your life. <coughs> Jesus said, in the world you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've, I've overcome the world. You're going to have the tribulation. And uh, the sooner you reckon with that and thank God for it and say, Lord, whatever this is, it's coming. I know it's coming from your hand directly to me. And I'm going to take comfort in that. So take comfort because God has not forgotten you, nor will he ever. They'll never forget those that are in his church. Your need is, uh, uh, take comfort that your need is by careful design, brought by your father. Take comfort because he knows, he knows your need, even if you don't fully understand it yet. Take comfort that your need is most certainly good and for your soul's benefit. We'll turn to Proverbs real quick. Proverbs 8. And then we'll turn to Hebrews. Uh, that's just a couple more verses to close out here. If you didn't have needs, people will say, well, I don't have any problems that a million dollars wouldn't solve. Oh, yeah, you do. Money is not going to solve any of those problems. In Proverbs 8, in verse 8, it says, all, um, I don't like that. I, I think I may have got the wrong. I'm going to read you a different one because it's, it's in here. But I don't see it as 8.8. Eight. Uh, huh. Let me quote it. It's, it's, it's in here and it may be in another place if you can find it. He said, remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. F feed me food convenient for me, said Solomon. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who's the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of God in vain. He's saying, you know, if, if you didn't have, if you had everything you needed, Solomon says, if you never had need, if you never had tribulation, why would you be any different than this to say, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? I don't, I don't need him. I got everything. So God brings these things by to show you uh, yourself and, to, and, and in mercy to your soul. Um, the other thing you can take comfort in and uh, turn to Hebrews here, if you would. You can take comfort that Christ knows all about it. You have a you have a captain of your salvation who has been there, who knows what it means to be in anguish, to knows what it means to be to face disappointment, if you will. Uh, in, in Hebrews in chapter two, in verse ten it says, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect <laughs> through suffering. Through suffering. And then down in verse 18, it says, for in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to succor or comfort them that are tempted. So you have a, this Christ Jesus that's preached from this pulpit week in and week out knows about knows what you're going through he knows it because he designed it 
and he is well able to comfort comfort you because he's been through all those things himself. And you can also uh, don't need to turn there, but in Second uh, Corinthians, it talks about uh, the pastors and elders, and he says to them, he tells them that. Uh, to, uh, Blessed be God, the Father and mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So you're surrounded by others who, by the hand of God, have gone through these things before you for your benefit. For your benefit. So you're not alone. You're not alone in the sense of God knows about it. You're not alone in the sense that God has brought it to your direction. He's surrounded you with, uh, in a church where others have gone through similar things, disappointments, discouragements, failures, loss, you name it. You name it. So I say, uh, take heed and, and be of good cheer and pray for grace and mercy. Put on the armor that God has given you, the word of God, prayer, uh, fellowship, uh, return to the fight by God's grace, uh, the good, the fight of, uh, of, of faith. In Proverbs 24, you don't need to turn there. It says, the just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked fall into mischief. God will, shall right, raise you up again. He'll take you through these stormy waters. He will comfort you. He knows your defenses. He knows your need. It's all there by perfect, perfect design. My suggestion would be, you know, to... Uh, like the thief on the cross to say, Lord, remember me. Remember me in this affliction. Remember me in my situation. Remember my disappointment. Uh, and uh, have mercy and give me direction in it. And uh, keep in mind, he's provided, he's provided those walls around you, those defenses and protections. Others who have been in similar spots before. And uh, all for your good. All for the glory of his son in providing and meeting your need in whatever way seems right is right for him and is definitely good for you.